Okay, afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's 2017-2018 Winter Webinar Series. My name is Colin Casson, and I'm the Project Specialist at the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, I'm hosting today's webinar from Balmy, Peterborough, Ontario. If you're first time joining the OIPC for a webinar, I'd like to say thanks for joining us and welcome. If you're IPC webinar regular, welcome back. A quick housekeeping notes before we begin today's webinar. All attendees have been placed on mute to start the webinar today. We encourage you to introduce yourself by typing into the chat bar on the right side of the screen. Shortly, our webinar leader will begin a presentation lasting approximately 45 minutes. Once the presentation is completed, we'll open up the phone lines one person at a time. Somebody's going to have a chance to raise questions or comments if they'd like. If you'd like to have your audio line unmuted at that time, I ask you to write your name in the chat box and a quick little unmute note so I'll be able to uh, allow you the opportunity. The 17-2018 series marks the fifth year of OIPC's winter webinar series, and we're very proud that that milestone is going to be marked this year by some of the most interesting and exciting content presented to date. As you may be aware, most previous OIPC webinar slides and recordings are archived on our website, and we encourage you to consult these resources for some most important information on issues pertaining to invasive plant management as they pertain to Ontario. Please visit us at www.ontarioinvasiveplants.ca slash webinars to view all this information and access a suite of other invasive plant control resources available for the low cost of free. As we're a nonprofit network that relies on our membership base to strengthen our ability to serve as the hub for the most current and accurate invasive plant management issues managers across Ontario. If more information on how to become a member and the benefits that provides, please check out our website. A quandary acknowledgement. The 2017-2018 Winter Webinar Series has been made possible thanks to funding by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much to ministry staff for providing us this opportunity to share the latest info on use of plant control through our network. As I mentioned, our 2017-2018 lineup features a really exciting group of presentations. Over the final three months of the series, we're going to have presentations on a to consider when embarking on control of a range of aquatic plants, including water soldier, European water chestnut, and Eurasian water milfoil. We're going to have an update on overwater Phragmites control efforts that are occurring this year again in the Long Point region. We're going to have a case study approach of how Ontario municipalities can become involved in the invasive plant control conversation. We're going to have a history and update on the invasion of purple loosestrife in Ontario with a focus of the bio, on the biocontrol efforts that contribute to its control. And lastly, we're going to have an explanation of the role that exotic earthworms play in control of invasive plants and associated restoration efforts. With all of that said, let's dig into today's eagerly anticipated webinar led by Rob Boucher of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, comes from Lethbridge, Alberta today. Rob is a research scientist and insect ecology and biological control expert with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. He's also an adjunct professor of the Faculty of Forestry at the University of Toronto. Specific research interests include host plant insect interactions population dynamics of biological control agents on their hosts, influence of habitat and climate on the impact of dispersal of biological control agents, and risk assessment of biocontrol agents. He's a Canadian lead for collaborative projects developing new biocontrol agents for cell invasive plants, including knotweeds, ragmites, swallowworts or dog strangling vines, and garlic mustard. Bob, thanks so much for joining us today. Give me a second here. I'm going to unmute you. And pass control over right now to you, Rob. And it's all yours. Rob, can you hear us?
I'm hearing you, Rob. Great folks, just hang out with us for one second here. We'll just get Rob sorted out. Talking now, can you hear me? Thank you very much. The joy of technology. And uh, thank you to the uh, Invasive Tech Council for setting this up. And today, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, implementing biocontrol programs for invasive plants in Ontario. I'd like to acknowledge my co authors, Lucas Seahausen and Sandy Smith at U of T. Uh, who worked on this with me. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is to give you an idea of just the process that we go through in trying to establish a biocontrol agent in Canada. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about uh, biocontrol in Canada, talk in the stages that we go through in the establishing the biocontrol program, and then I'm going to give some more details using a biocontrol agent on, on Dying lean vine or swallowwort type Pina opulenta to sort of take you through those stages and tell you where we are with the garlic mustard program. mine program. So to begin with, what do I have biocontrol? And I want you to have a close look at this picture because there's going to be homework at the end of the talk uh, to what uh, we'll do with this. But to begin with, what's biological control? It's in our case what we're talking about is the use of live organisms. Uh, insects to suppress and introduce pests or weed. And can do this, so the rationale behind it is that these invasive plants are introduced, they have no natural predators. They come from somewhere else, in this case, uh, Europe. They have natural predators, and what we're trying to do is reunite the weed with its biocontrol agent and restore some sort of ecological balance between them. Uh, Cost effective at the scale of the problem. Often biological control is used as a last resort. We tried everything else, so you have a huge problem on your hands. Uh, these biocontrol agents uh, are self-sustaining. They can move with the host plant, track the host plant, uh, bring control in an area, and then as the host plant pops up in new new areas, uh, move to those areas. It's relatively low environmental impact compared to other uh, control tactics. And they can help address the weed resistance to chemicals, which is becoming uh, a, a problem as we move forward. So what we're trying to do with biological control. Uh, on the left here, we have a weed, in this case, nodding thistle. Uh, on the right, we have the biocontrol agent, Rhinocillus conchus. Um, case in the 60s, the, the population level here is the dot line is uh, the nodding thistle. The solid line is rhinocillus when the weevil was introduced. So basically what you see is that the dotted line goes down as the population, the solid line of rhinocillus uh, increases and then we get to some sort of around 1977, some sort of equilibrium that's much more tolerable than the level of nodding thistle that we had at the beginning. So this is what we're trying to do with weed biocontrol. That's our goal. Some weed biocontrol history in Canada at least began 1951, uh, targeting St. John's wort with the bill on the right here, uh, which is a uh, Carolina species, uh, was released as a leaf feeder. Since that time, there's been about 80 foreign insects released targeting 27 different weeds. 56% of these that were released, the insects were released established, which means they're present in Canada. Of 18 have had documented impact. There were early successes with St. John's wort. Uh, nodding thistle, and most recently we've had success with the leafy spurge, houndstongue, Dalmatian toad flax, and diffuse knapweed. 
uh, with purple loosestrife, which is not on this list. I said earlier that biocontrol is often the option of last resort, and I want to emphasize that. <laughs> when you're dealing with a problem, in this case, like phomites, um, it's not a lot of things that are going to work, and some like Phragmites or dog strangling behind been here for a long time and then gone through some sort of population growth phase, seen over the landscape, huge problem. So when you have that sort of problem, it's going to take time for anything to work, including biocontrol. And you all have a couple of options. You can do nothing, uh, use herbicide, you can use cultural control, pulling the weed, biocontrol, or some combination of all of those things in an, in an IBM strategy. Uh, but the important point is, is that all of these approaches have some level of target and non-target impact and risk. There's no such thing as no risk. What we're really trying to do is balance that risk uh, to try and minimize the negative impacts that those invasive species are having uh, using a tool that's going to be less, uh, less of a risk to the environment. So part two, I was going to go through the stages of weed biocontrol program. And every single program goes through these sort of seven steps. I'm going to talk more in more detail about them uh, when I get to the dog strangling vine example. But suffice it to say, begin by looking at what the weed's doing country? Is it having a big enough problem? What sort of species interactions are there? You decide to have a biocontrol program, you go to the country of origin where the weed came from, do exploration and try and identify some agents, followed by host range studies and biology studies to make sure that it's safe and effective. You then petition for the agent to release to regulators, which is a process in itself. This is followed by rearing and field release research, establishment, and then redistribution. So all of these steps, uh, there, there are research questions involved in this, and I hope to, in this talk, show you some of the issues that we deal with uh, and address in trying to get these agents out there. Just to note that to go from stage one to stage five, so when you've identified that we're going to go with a control program based on the interactive studies or biology studies you've done in the country, to getting to the point that you're rearing something to average about 10 years, and mention what we're really trying to do is, is accelerate this process, again, better at it um, for our research program. So move the case study with DSV and vincitoxicum species. Uh, what are we dealing with? Well, there's two plants. There's the black swallow wart, uh, vincitoxicum migrum, uh, or, or in uh, Western Europe, Portugal, Spain, France, and Italy, problem in natural disturbed areas, pastures, forests, and roadside margins. And there is the pale swallowwort, more of a Eastern European thing, so Eastern European Russia, a similar habitat to the black swallowwort, but also moves into forest understories. This is North America, the two plants. The green here is the pale swallowwort, the white is the black swallowwort. Um, you can see in Ontario, we're dealing with much more pale swallowwort that is known to most of you that are listening. Uh, there are a few patches of black swallowwort there, but, but the predominant problem is black is more of a problem on the eastern seaboard. Close area distribution, you can just see again, uh, mostly pale swallowwort. These, these data are somewhat uh, from the mid 2000s, so there's, there's definitely more points if you went to somewhere like EdMaps. Uh, you see more, more data points, but to give you an idea that it's covering most of southern Ontario. So those stages of a weed biocontrol program. I mentioned species or actions in Canada. And what do I mean by this? Well, you've got an invasive plant that's come into the country. You have to ask, where is it? Factors are Where is it going to go? Is it really a problem? And how is it economically and ecologically? Uh, the questions that really justify going forward uh, with the biological program biological control program. So the types of work that have been done on dog strangling vine work by Nomi Cappuccino and colleagues looking at just the invasiveness, interaction with old field communities, native insect communities. Are there any other native insects that are moving over onto this plant and feeding on it that might uh, solve our problem? Uh, so looking at plant chemistry, a lot of invasive plants have very uh, different plant chemistries which can enhance their ability to invade habitats. Uh, Tony Tomaso has looked at the biology 
Stephen Dusher taxonomy. There's a key paper in 2005 for DSV in the series of invasive plants of Canada that summarizes a lot of this info. Uh, Lindsay Milbrow and Adam Davis have been working on stage-specific population models. Uh, Mary-Claude LeBon and Rene Sforza in Europe have been looking at molecular genetics. So a lot of information being gathered about what's going on with DSV, uh, what is it doing? Well, in Ontario, uh, DSV overlaps with the Carolinian forest. There's greater than 125 plant species that are federally, provincially listed. It's also invading globally of our habitats, limestone plain. So the impact that it's having on the environment, it's significant, uh, along with data that's been collected, decision made uh, in the early 2000s to go ahead uh, with the biological control program. So if you do that, what do you do? You go to where the thing came from. In this case, uh, Europe, and Europe, as I mentioned, Rossicum is more of an eastern species, Nigrum is more of a western species, and then overlaying these, we have white swallowwort, which opens up in the distribution. So there were field surveys started in 2006 uh, in Ukraine and Switzerland, with colleagues at CABI uh, to try and find uh, effective or potential biocontrol agents that would be specific only to Vincitoxicum and also have an impact on the plant. What they found to begin with was uh, five different insects that were chosen. The first one being this root fear. It's a beetle. Uh, it's found uh, on swallowwort, sorry, on white swallowwort and black swallowwort in France. Uh, tended to be an open field habitat. A little bit of a wrinkle with it is that it took one to three years uh, to develop. Um, and its life cycle can be quite extended, so that makes it quite challenging. Uh, to post range testing. Nevertheless, it was selected because of the impact that it could have on the plant. Uh, we also had three different Vincitoxicum leaf years, a moth, a Brostula, a Brostula asclepius, Prilina, and another moth, Hypena opulenta, which were from different uh, Vincitoxicum host plants in Europe uh, and different habitats. Hypena was selected as the agent to, the agent to petition uh, it was found on Vincitoxicum rostrum in forest habitats, but mostly because it was multivolting. It had multiple generations, um, and we figured that the potential to have more impact on plant. Finally, was the seed feeder, Euphranta connexa, which is a tephritic fly. This is a good one because it lays eggs in uh, the, the seed pods. As the seed pods develop, it destroys the seed, and that helps prevent um, the spread of uh, DSV. It was found on uh, polywort in open edge and forest habitat. So those are the five insects that were considered and, and initiated uh, the next stage, which was biology and host range studies. Uh, and what do we mean by those and what are we doing in those? Well, to begin with, we want to sure that any of these agents that are released in Canada and North America will only feed on DSV. We only releasing specialist insects they will not feed on other non-target plants. To do that sort of testing, we take a phylocentrific approach uh, developed first by Wapsphere in 74. We'll start with DB as, as we definitely want that as our control, and then test other milk genera that are similar to DSV uh, plant in the plant test list, others in the same uh, taxonomic family that might be related to uh, uh, DSV and that could also be potential hosts and to crops and ornamental plants, so economic plants or in ecologic plants that would be of ecological concern, threatened and endangered species that may be in the same habitat as the DSV is working. All this testing is focused on making sure that it only feeds on Cetoxicum. So those strange testing for Tina opulenta, the, moth, the real test plant list. Uh, which was developed for USDA APHIS tag by Lindsay Milbraff and Jeremy Biazzo in 2007, had 57 species on it. And these are representative species. There's no way that you can go out and test every single species. So what we're trying to do is choose the key uh, species that might be exposed to the plant in the same habitat or that are closely related uh, to TSV and likely uh, more likely to be vulnerable to feeding. On that additional list, 
There are 36 native North American species and 21 introduced economic species that were that were to be tested. In addition, plant species were added if insects in the same genera attacked them in, in anywhere. In this case, for Carolina, there were Artemisia species were happened were added because there were uh, Carolina species that fed on them. Similarly, for Abrostola and Hypena, the Urticea were added because there were insects in those genera that were to feed on those host plants. In different species, but but they were added for testing for that reason. The tests that were done were over position tests and no choice larval feeding tests. In terms of adult over position, will lay eggs on these plants uh, if they're exposed to them. And then in terms of no choice larval feeding tests, if a larvae is on a plant, uh, will feed on it and develop on it. And so tests are quite conservative. Uh, we want to sure that it's not going to do anything negative. Uh, and uh, the, the insect basically either feed uh, or so it's it's a no choice uh, test. So what happened in those no choice tests or the screening that was done? I mentioned earlier this is the root feeding beetle. Uh, quite encouraging in terms of that it had the first question: Would it develop on the two target weeds because it came from a white swallowwort? The answer was yes, and it had significant impact. Unfortunately, in whole range testing, it would overposit and develop on some native North American milkweeds in no choice test. So for now, uh, because of that result, the screening has been stopped to this insect, and it will not be petitioned at this time for release. Uh, this, I mentioned that this is a no choice test. What follows is a series of multiple choice testing and additional work to try and figure out uh, the selection behavior of this insect, but it's not being, uh, the screening has been stopped for now. Similarly, with the leaf feeding beetle, Chrysalina, again, larvae fed on both pale swallowwort and black swallowwort, but the, in host range testing, it was feeding native North American Asclepia species and even more, a broader feeding on Asteraceae. So this one had the screening has been stopped and will not. Uh, it will be considered as a biocontrol agent. Uh, for me with or with the uh, seed head fly, it does as well. It successfully develops on the two target plants, and screening and host range impact continuing continuing at CABI. This is a tricky one because in order to test it, you have to get the plants to flower and produce seed so that there's seed for the flies to attack. Um, and often one of the challenges in doing this host range testing is you've got a whole list of 50, 80 plants, uh, many of which, some of which may be endangered, that you have to figure out how to grow and propagate, and in this case, get to make seed in the lab in order to be able to test them. And that's part of the reason that the process uh, can take uh, tears to do screening and make sure that it's safe. Uh, the next one, the, the moth, the Brostola sclepius, this is a unifolding defoliator. It occurs in open habitats. It too affects both of the target weed. In range testing, it was specific to Vincitoxicum, and screening is completed, and we have a petition ready to go uh, to the regulators. That We have not done that because we've been initially to focus on Hypena opulenta. As I mentioned earlier, it's multivolting and has impact on both Vincitoxicum. In sizing the toast range testing, of 820 larvae tested, 79 different plant species, so that was the, li the final list that was tested. Uh, there was successful development to adult only on Vincitoxicum. This is a very specific insect. The one larvae that survived to the fifth instar on this species, Bohemera, Bohemera and one larvae that survived to the second instar on Urtica, but both subsequently died. Uh, based on this host range testing data that was done, this is a very specific insect and moved forward with the petitioning. Just, I mentioned the multivolting nature of it. To give you a background on the biology of this moth, it winters as a pupae uh, that hatches out to be a moth in the uh, early spring and summer. Legs, the third panel over, uh, goes through five larval instars, and pupates again, and that cycle is repeated uh, in the one in Canada, we think, in the, up to the fourth, a pupae, and then over winters, it may be uh, more generations as you move. Uh, they're south, but this is something we have to figure out and work on. So as we petition for the agent release, in this case, Hypena opulenta, and what is the petitioning process? Uh, in this case, 
Canada, there's just come out a reference guide uh, to the process of importation of biocontrol agents in Canada. This is a reference guide. It has all the information requirements of an example petition. The web address is down below at the bottom here, and I'd be happy to forward you that if you don't get it in time on the presentation. But basically what the petition does is summarize all the information that's available on the, in, on the target weed, the impacts that it's having, uh, the justification for the biocontrol program, summarizes all the known information about the biocontrol agent, the whole range testing data, and then proposes based on those data to uh, release the agent. And that's the package in a petition that's sent to the regulators. The idea of the petitioning for the release of agents in Canada, the uh, five uh, recent agents that have been petitioned a fly, a psyllid on knotweed, uh, weevil on toad flax, and then a hypena that I'm talking about today on swallowworts, and only a gall wasp on hawkweed. Um, to give you an idea, the petitions, it takes about two years from the time that the petition is submitted to the time that a permitting letter uh, has been released. And so there's a fairly extensive review process that goes on uh, with the Canadian Biocontrol Review Committee as well as the USDA APHIS tag to review these by different government agencies uh, to ensure uh, that the issue should go forward. In that review, they're basically making a recommendation uh, to, to release the agent, to request data, or to reject the agent. So timeline, I'm just going to run through that. Stage 2, 2006. Identification and collection of the moth as a potential biocontrol agent in Donetsk, Ukraine. Uh, this followed by uh, five years of testing at the University of Rhode Island and CABI in Switzerland to uh, the specificity of the agent. In 2011, a joint release petition for Canada and the U.S. Sub was submitted. Uh, and following in 2000, June 2012, following a review by the review committees, the response was requesting additional testing and replication for key plant species to uh, and also testing of additional genetic stock because it was felt that uh, the initial collection might have missed some of the variation in the hypena populations. Uh, and so additional collections were made from the original site in Donetsk, Ukraine, and uh, additional testing followed. By this, testing and collection was completed by January 2013 when a supplemental package was submitted to the regulators. By September 2013, uh, both the Canadian Bio Control Review Committee and the APHIS Technical Advisory Group recommended the release. And in September 2013, uh, SIA granted a release letter for, Hy for Hypena oculenta in Canada. So as earlier, that stage one to stage five used about 10 years. Hypena took only seven, so we are getting better at it. It's also a, a, a comment on the work that was done by Aaron Weed at the University of Rhode Island, who, who did much of the screening of these agents uh, with Hazelhurst for Alex's master's and Aaron's PhD, and they did a, an incredible job to, to get this work done. Uh, that's what's really uh, the basis of getting uh, the agent released. So now I'll switch over to where we are with Hypena. We're at that stage five. We've got permission, or we received permission in 2013. You've been working with this insect in our case for uh, seven years. And uh, the first thing you have to do is figure out how to get the agent reared in sufficient numbers to get them out there into the field. So just to go through our rearing program, you know, you start with moths in cages, exposed to the plants, uh, to the SV plants, this is all being done in Lethbridge. Um, you, the moths then hatch into these small larvae down at the, in the bottom picture, and they make these little wee tiny small larvae windows in the leaves. Um, that's then followed by uh, a fair amount of defoliation that takes place in the cages, and then you've got to keep adding plants until eventually you can produce uh, adults and turn them over and, and produce more. Because doing a lot of this work, um, out in Lethbridge, where we don't have any dog strangling vine, um, we've started working with artificial diets, where we successfully incorporated high uh, DSV material into artificial diets and can rear the insects uh, from instar to adult 
produce us that will lay viable eggs. So this is one of the other first things we had to figure out uh, overcome in order to get uh, insects into the field. The police locations in uh, Ontario, or Ottawa, and around Toronto. Uh, this is the same distribution map I showed you earlier in terms of where the DSB was. Uh, when we're going out to do these field releases, then there's a whole bunch of other research questions, like which should we put out? Should we put them out in fall when they're in diapause, or should we put them out in early spring when they're in non-diapause and let them feed through the summer? By diapause, I mean the, the overwintering quiescent state that they go to to survive the winter. Um, when should we put them out? In the year, middle of the year when there's lots of foliage, late in the year, as I mentioned, when they can go into a diapause state over the winter. Where? On the forest edge, uh, fields uh, in the forest, and on which host plant? Should we target um, swallowwort or, or black swallowwort? And how many of those insects to put out? They're very in short supply. You never have enough of them. So how sort of release rate can we use that's going to get those insects established? So between 2013 on the column here to 2016, the colors line up with the question that was being addressed. Um, and we have the timing, different times of the year when releases were done, uh, stages of the insects, whether they were large larvae, small larvae, adults, uh, basically to try and address these questions. Trying a lot of different combinations in order to get the insects established. Um, up until 2016, we'd re by then we've released about uh, 21,000 and individuals to try and get uh, populations established. This is what the field release looks like. Uh, you get a larvae at least, you get this defoliant in a uh, leaf. There's nothing else that will defoliate um, ASV. Some cases there are slugs that can cause something, some very to the leaves, but this sort of shoveling and uh, feeding the leaves is distinctive to, to uh, hypena. Uh, so you see this, this is this you the model in the area. So just summarize where we are in 2017. There's over 22,000 larvae released. We've also done adult releases, which I'm going to refer to a bit in a minute. Uh, have successful establishment at least one site area, and we we're pretty confident about a second site in the Toronto area, um, and possibly a third. At the audit site, we got second generation in all four years. And what that means is, is that the we, when we're done early on in 2014, the larvae were there. And subsequently, we found small larvae in August, meaning that the population had turned over. Uh, Sadly, we got spread of a minimum of 700 meters, and in 2017, up to two kilometers from the original release location, indicating that the moths are dispersing. And the good as well is that U.S. releases sit in August of 2017. Uh, the U.S. has a different uh, regulatory process that takes a little bit longer. And now we're going to be uh, releasing insects as well. And hopefully that will increase the spread of the population. What's happening right now is that the insects are there, but not causing a huge amount of defoliation. And this is uh, something uh, we're looking at. So looking at what the research challenges are, I mentioned earlier with that first question, who to put out there, um, we selected this agent, Hypena, because of its multivolting nature, figuring that you could release throughout the summer, populations would go through a generation and then over winter. What I found this year, uh, with work done in, in release cages, is that we have, we have uh, four cages here, one, two, three, four. The red here is the photo period. At the, to the year and along the uh, x-axis is the date and the y-axis we have the day length in photo period. We're doing rearing we know that we can produce non-diapause insects with a 16-hour photo period and diapause insects for sure with a 12-hour photo period. So it, to date those were the rearing conditions that we had used. What we found out this summer was that if we released insects into a cage uh, just before the summer solstice, solstice, so the last day of the year, year about 15 and a half hour photo period, uh, by releases sequentially after that, uh, they 
bring uh, adults into the cage to lay eggs, then the and then collecting pupae at the end of when they emerge in the cage. All pupae that were released before the summer solstice emerge none to diapause. If we leave age two very close to the summer solstice, and any time afterwards, all those pupae are are going into diapause when they when they emerge. They they come pupae, but then they are ready to overwinter. What this means is is that we have a very limited time window to get the larvae out those multiple generations. The release have to be done basically before the third week of June. And those insects will indeed complete another generation and have more impact. Uh, this is something that we didn't know uh, and we started doing the, the field work and the releases. So a very short window to produce and release larvae. All we early on was trying to produce as many larvae as we could, releasing them throughout the summer. Uh, it seemed that uh, like that a lot of those larvae were going to diapause, and we may have a lot more individuals out there. So the solution to that was to winter diet rearing. I mentioned earlier on that we had developed an artificial diet. We could do winter diet rearing, stockpile those pupae in diapause at a short photo period, and release adults early in the year. And this is what we're doing now. We have a field cage here. The two... Uh, the two containers in there that you can see through the cage, and on the right is a close-up. Uh, bottom of these containers is vermiculite with pupae. The pupae hatch, and the moths crawl up and emerge from those containers, and then they will oviposit on the DSV uh, in the cages. And by doing that, uh, it allows us to spread out our rearing effort and stockpile material to get a lot more material uh, out there early in the season, which we now know that we have to do. Um, this is what you get cages. Again, that defoliation of the leaves, it, it can get quite hot. The plants can get stripped as the density of moths uh, can be quite high. And this is the sort of impact you can have. We open up these cages and then let the moths out um, to disperse. The other thing, challenge that we have on three here is we have the, the insects are there. They're at low density and getting relatively uh, low population growth and spark foliation. We're not getting huge areas defoliated yet, um, but we think that this is, we're really establishing a lag phase. We've got to get our timing right for getting the releases out there. Uh, also, these ins have been in rearing for quite a period of time in the screening process. There's an adaptation period that's quite common in biocontrol agents before we get out there and populations start to increase. So what we're doing is monitoring that dispersal and spread. And this can be as exciting as watching paint dry, but remember that it's a long time uh, that these plants have been here. They've got a big head start. Uh, Bontrol is not an overnight solution. It's a long-term solution. Um, and that's what we're working towards. So I'm at homework. We're going back to that picture. We're at a point now um, with the uh, mobbing out there that we think there's probably a fair amount of dispersal going on in those areas in Ontario, around Ottawa, around Toronto, um, where we might start to see defoliation on DB plants next summer. If you do, please take a picture, email it to me, and we'll come and check it out because we're trying to track that long-term, that, that wide area spread that may be going on. This is what it can look like in the fields uh, that was small larvae earlier making those larval pictures on the on the leaves. You get uh, larger larvae feeding, you're going to get the holes right through the leaves and you're going to get this, this shot hole situation. Summarize. I don't know, the take-homes of biocontrol is an important management tool for invasive plants in Canada. Uh, go through a seven-step process to ensure safe and effective agents. And our research program is really trying to improve our agent selection screening efficacy. FINA, what we're doing with, uh, we're at that stage five of trying to get it out there and established and widely on DSV. Uh, we have a release prescription in place to to release adults, and we're at that dispersed lag phase uh, where we're trying to see where uh, things are going. Hopefully, populations are going to increase over time. To uh, that and acknowledge colleagues that have helped with this work uh, at U of T, company people working with Silvicon, uh, 
follow this. And so uh, at the bottom here, funding sources that were uh, used work. And with that, I'll end. thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Rob. That was a great presentation and certainly a lot of content. And I've got a lot of questions just starting to come in here. Um, so just as a reminder, we've got a few minutes left here. Um, so if anybody has any questions that they'd like to type into the chat box, please feel free to do so. Just click the icon on your right-hand side there and type in a question, either address it to all attendees or to the presenter or host or whoever you'd like. Uh, alternatively, if you'd like to, we tried this last time and who knows what their tech uh, challenges today, what's going to happen, but if you'd like to kind of raise a more um, detailed question, maybe you'd just like to say hello to Rob uh, through our audio connection, just type in your name in caps and the word unmute and I'll try and get to you in due course and uh, on you. So with that in mind, please feel free to keep, uh, I see a couple questions coming in, please feel free to keep putting them in here. Um, I've got one that came in mid-presentation. Rob, I'll, I'll fire it at you if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so the comment reads, Rob, thank you for your excellent presentation. As I'm sure you're aware, speaking to colleagues in the public about biological control can be a bit difficult due to well-publicized historic attempts that miss the mark. How do you explain what current biological uh, control programs uh, differ, and how do they differ from the decades past? I guess, w what's your approach, kind of speaking with the public and explaining why DSV, Hypena, biocontrol is different from the cane toad, I guess, or, or historic <laughs> examples? Uh, well, I, I guess we have another talk, which uh, I have given one other one, which is everything that biocontrol isn't. And, uh, um, one of the things is, 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 is a cane that always comes up. The thing, I tried to highlight here the process that we go through with the screening to ensure the specificity of these uh, biocontrol agents. The cane toad would never be released today. Um, it was a mistake, um, and uh, it, there were very little screening, if any, done um, to, to uh, check its specificity. Uh, so. Thing, to the, the really, the point is, is it's apples and oranges in terms of of the the approach we take, and basically would not um, that process of ensuring the specificity. I mentioned that it's feeding on the the uh, on target uh, milk. We've the screen on that agent is stopped. It's not going to be considered. It's not specific enough. So, um, what we would base any uh, proposal to release agents on is that specificity and the, the safety of the agents. It's uh, and think how like King would not uh, ever be considered. Okay. Very good. Um, we've got a question here from Nancy. Nancy's wondering if the defoliation on DSV actually kills the plant, or do you predict it's going to take multiple years of heavy defoliation to actually result in mortality? It'll definitely take multiple years of heavy defoliation to, to cause mortality. Um, where the type of impact that we have in lab studies um, show that it can, um, and the lab plants, and it's important to note that the plants in the field are much more established and will take more defoliation. Uh, but can kill plants in lab cages, uh, what we're expecting initially with the plant in the field is that you are reducing your biomass and reducing the seed set, reducing their spread. Um, we're not sure whether you can get high enough levels of defoliation to kill the plant in the field, but you will definitely reduce the biomass. You have to go through that lag phase of trying, of the populations have to adapt to conditions and then build up within an area to cause sufficient defoliation. One of the things we're trying to do with the field cages is concentrate the defoliation and see um, what level you can get in a cage. And you can strip the plants in a cage, um, but whether or not, uh, what long-term impact that has, that's something we have to follow up. Okay. Uh, questions coming in about um, other biocontrol agents. Um, we have Brock who's asking um, if there's been any updates on how, uh, sorry. Yeah, 
Oh, sorry, just Japanese knotweed is the kind of question they're asking here. Okay, there was, for Japanese knotweed, I just switched to a new slide. I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, so this, what this slide has is the agents, for each of these weeds, it's what stage they're at and whether there's agents available for it. So the, the, t the ones in the top, there are agents available. We're looking at long-term impact that they're having. Um, this is an agent, a, a psyllid that has been released in Ontario, BC, and Alberta for knotweed. Uh, this was done in 2014. Uh, we have, again, it's at a similar point where we're trying to figure out what are the parameters needed to get it to overwinter and survive. Um, the first year we did get overwintering from our releases. The second year in Ontario uh, we did not, and so we we're look, we we're going to look again next year. Um, to see what's going on. We're hopeful that we have selected, uh, in terms of the psyllid, um, a field adapted line that's hardier, um, and we're following that up. So that, that's the answer to the psyllid. We, there's a question here about Phragmites. There are agents, a moth for Phragmites, that is at the process of just being option for release. Screening is basically done. And we're hoping to get that in this year. Um, there have been some delays in the submission of that petition because in uh, in Louisiana, there on the native Phragmites there, there's an insect that has just come in. They think from Asia that's had significant impact on the Rosso cane. It's called in Louisiana, and um, we're waiting to see whether that insect might actually feed on the introduced Phragmites. Um, there's work ongoing testing that by uh, researchers in Louisiana. Um, from what I know that, it like it prefers the native Phragmites as opposed to the invasive, but that's ongoing work. Uh, and then, yeah, that's I think that answers the questions about what other things are targeted. There's an agent that's just been petitioned for mustard, uh, and that, that petition has just been submitted, and we're hopeful to get a permit for that in the next little while. Uh, at least in Ontario. That's like something to keep in mind. Very rarely will we come across in Ontario any sort of um, damage to garlic mustard. Is that is that maybe the kind of thing that we'd start to see more and more as this process goes along? Again, an above ground herbivore that you're talking about. Right? So the one on garlic mustard that's being released is actually uh, feeds on the stem and on the root. We're targeting the roots because we're trying to, uh, that's where we're going to get the most impact on the plant. Um, that's why the root feeder that was initially uh, scored for DSV was very attractive because it has a huge impact and kills the plant. Unfortunately, it's not specific enough um, at this time. So, um, you haven't seen anything yet on garlic mustard because we haven't released it, but yeah, eventually um, if we get a permit to release it, um, you'll have to pick up. Uh, it makes little, very characteristic feeding pictures in the stem, and then they are in the roots, so you won't see them until the plants are dead, hopefully. Mm. Okay, um, we've got one more question here. Just as a quick reminder, if anybody has any burning questions, type in in the chat box, or let me know, and I'll try and unmute you. Uh, we've got one text that just came in here. Uh, it's a question about implementation about Hypena, I guess, or it probably applies to any others, but, but um, when it does get to that point, uh, asking where you know how do you see larger scale implementation potentially rolling out? Is this the kind of best case scenario could be available to private landowners one day that you hope? Um, we're working with a company, Silvacon, in Ontario, uh, who's involved in developing some of the rearing work that they've been doing, um, and they're they're using it as, I mean, basically DSV is a problem in woodlots. Uh, they do woodlot management, and it's, it may be available through them as a package of uh, nests that you would be able to buy a certain number of hypena and get them out there and released on your land. Not there yet, um, in terms of getting it established and understanding the parameters, uh, where it's going to go, where it's going to have impact, that sort of thing. But actually, yes, there would be a few rolling it out that, that way. One of the things that I'm asking with this, the home question is to say, well, as earlier, when we were releasing larvae, uh, 
through the summer, we may have had a lot of dispersing moths that have out over the landscape. When dealing with an ocean, it's hard to detect those, and there's an awful lot of DSV out there. So it's it's looking for assistance from the land people on landowners that are starting to pick up that defoliation to try and see how moths have spread. I mean, you can get moths spreading long distances on on wind currents in some cases, and we don't know right now how far it may have spread. So, um, that the how do how does one qualify for a release site? Is we're not at the point of sort of saying uh, there's, no, there's insects available and everybody can have them, um, but and be involved in that monitoring to see where they are and know if they, if they're picking them up. So that answers the question of can I have a bunch of these moths, please? Um. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have lots available in a short time, but it's it's early. Um, um, Rob, we just have somebody asking if you could just kind of recite your email again quickly, so everybody has it handy. Okay, it's it's uh, Bert dot b o u r c h i e r a e r d c c a on the bottom of that slide if they can still see that. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And so we'll have these slides posted uh, or some version of them hopefully within a day or two as well. So everybody will have access to that. Yeah. Uh, um, let's see. So somebody here is asking about um, just kind of how do you keep in the loop with broad updates on this project? I know that I think it's one of Naomi Cappuccino's uh, grad students maybe or maybe it's uh, her who runs a blog just with some, some kind of updates. I'm not sure if that's accurate. Well, but. yeah. Uh, we haven't, there a, uh, for now, if you're interested, you can send me an email. We have a list that sent out the information to the people that have emailed and said they want to keep up to date for for, for um, Hypena. Uh, what we're hoping to do with, uh, Nate Cappuccino has a blog about Lily Leaf Beetle, and there is a similar page there, Report Occurrences of Hypena, but that, haven't got that basically running for now. It would be better just to send me an email directly. Um, and uh, that's going to do it for well, now. And as once we get that website functional, if it's working, uh, we'll let people know. Good. Uh, I've got one more question here. Uh, somebody just asking a kind of a broad question: Are, Is there a, an approved list of kind of historic examples of, of when released? And they're still currently being released. How can you get some, or what is the facilitator contact info? Do you um, know anything like that exists? It, it's we're we're working on it. There's a the website again coming for Canada, which will say these are the agents that are available, um, and then I get them. A lot of these are historical agents that may already be out there, and it's not the right now. There isn't necessarily a um, a, uh, a facility that's producing them for people to use. Um, so it's that's something that we're working towards. Um, if you have a problem on a particular weed, if you Google biocontrol of that, quite often it'll come up with whether or not there's agents available in North America just in terms of the research that's been done. Um, for now, if you're really if you're keen or interested, they could email and we can answer those questions. Uh, one, again, once we get that website up and running, um, hopefully that'll, we can direct you to that website with the list. I've got somebody noting the observation that DSV tends to do really well on roadsides and uh, maybe it gets the implementation phase in MTO partnership might make a lot of sense. A good observation. We certainly see lots of it along for serious highways and other highways in Ontario. Um, yeah, of DSV. Okay. That's of DSV. Yeah. Uh, I mean, mostly where we're targeting releases now are in open fields and forest forest habitats. Um, but the questions, we, the reason we have a brostal of the second moth is that it's an open field species. Uh, we were hoping that Hypena would be effective in open fields and forests so that we'd only have to release one agent. The, we're still not 
and we know yet whether Optina will only work in forests. Um, so we're to do that, yeah, we have to make sure that, that the wind is going to be affected in those, those habitats. But, but that's a good observation. Okay, I hope I didn't miss any questions there. That was uh, one of the best attended webinars. So, Rob, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to present to us today. And uh, we'll be in touch, hopefully, if we can maybe get some of these slides posted on our website shortly. But uh, thank you again so much on behalf of the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. What a great webinar. And uh, we look forward to hearing some nice uh, updates in the future. Great. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. We'll see you in a couple weeks.